We have a very good panel here today. We're going to be going through a lot of, uh, a lot of material, but we have a lot of knowledge on this stage. And uh, I'll just quickly um, tell you who my, form my panelists here, Howard Chow, who's an old friend of mine here to my right, uh, senior Asia partner for O'Melveny & Meyer, has been doing China deals for probably more years than he wants to remember. Um, David Bonderman, founding partner at TPG Capital. Very, very kind of you to come today, David. On my left is Benjamin Fanger, uh, the co-founder and the managing director of Shoreline Capital, who does a lot of interesting things in China. And John Pitar, the uh, managing director of CLSA, Capital Partners, based in Hong Kong. Um, as you know, our panel today is uh, how well can you know a company? And we're going to be looking at uh, Chinese uh, company structures and solutions on trying to understand them and roadblocks and ways to overcome them and ways to understand the diversity. We're going to go through quite a few things. Um, if you, uh, just as a, a bit of an overview, if you really look at the Chinese c uh, company landscape today, it is, you name a kind of company and it's there. In 79, when Deng took over, Basically, what built China the first 15 years or so was township and village enterprises. These were farmers who were able to gather some capital when they were able to sell their crops on the market, or they took over collectives or small state enterprise and built them up. And by the mid-90s, they, they were responsible for about 135 million jobs and about 38% of industrial output. Meanwhile, the state-owned enterprise, and you can never forget, the, Ch the basic core of the Chinese economy comes from 1950, uh, when the Russians came in, and in the 1950s, uh, they built the state-planned economy with state-owned enterprise, state planning, etc., state banks. All of that core is still there in a very strong way. But it was a mess. Zhu uh, Rongji came in to clean it up. They looked at Japan, they studied Japanese structures, they studied the Korean structures. In the end, they came up with kind of their own hybrid by a process of trial and error. But Ju had to clean up the state-owned enterprise, so from the, about 93 to 2003, they laid off 50 million people. They corporatized these entities with, with shareholding structures. They formed the State Assets Commission, SASAC, to be the shareholder. Uh, and that now is a very, very strong part of the economy. As much as 50%, it's really hard to, hard to nail down. But if you look at state-owned enterprise, there's about 115,000 uh, companies in China that have, carry that designation. Uh, many of them are private or uh, act like very private companies because they were entrepreneurs who, back in the day, it wasn't politically... Uh, uh, safe to be a big entrepreneur, so they parked themselves under a, a government or they came out of a government and they still have government shareholders, but they operate. The, some of these companies have partnerships that are very good globally. And then you get the big central SOEs in Beijing. Uh, out of the Beijing SASAC, there's 117 of them, and they're um, often monopolies and um, maybe not all that efficient, and some of them are the names you probably know best. So, and then we had private equity venture capital came in with a dot-com boom, and now we've got every kind of, any kind of structure there is, and today we're going to delve a bit into that, and that will bring me, that will bring me to starting out here with Howard. You know, Howard, you've been doing deals for a long time of all different kinds in China. Can you just kind of give an overview of the different ki types of companies, how people should look at them as investors, and... Right. So, yeah, so... Thanks, uh, Jim. So I, I think you've already done a pretty good job of laying out some of the, the, the diversity of companies in China. And, and you know, when we, we look at a company in China for many reasons, and it can come up in many different contexts, uh, whether it's an IPO, whether it's an acquisition, whether it's an investment, whether it's a credit a decision, uh, you know, this is one of the key factors, is how does this company fit into the, all these different categories that we're talking about. I mean, in the U.S., you may not think about it as much, you know, whether it's um, private equity backed or a family company or whatever, in terms of you know, thinking about how you evaluate the credibility of the company. But in China, it is so critically important to look behind um, many different factors in, uh, in evaluating a company and, and assessing who they really are. And one of them is what you just described, which is this, this history 
um, and, and the ownership structure of, of companies. Um, and as you said, China has done this terrific job of creating successor, successive layers of reform and, and concurrently successive layers of different kinds of companies. And it, the ebb and flow continues, right? Whether it's, um, you know, the, the state sector advances in the last 10 years, whether the new regime is going to pull back some on that. Uh, all of these are, are, are um, um, changes that uh, affect how we evaluate companies. But so to, to take some examples, you know, um, the, the state ownership tradition continues very strongly in China. And as we know, and, and as you say in your recent book, Jim, um, the state sector has, is stronger than ever now in China. Um, and whether the company is publicly listed or whether it's completely owned by the state, if it has a tradition of being a state enterprise sector company and the management is being selected by the party central you know, um, personnel department, then that company has a particular set of characteristics of personality that's going to be different than another publicly listed company, which uh, is venture, was venture back, private equity back, and taken public, and the management came from you know, Silicon Valley and, and went back to China. So uh, you have to look, you, you have to start with these different kinds of ownership structures and backgrounds, but then you have to look behind them at the history of the company, how it fits in to the whole flow of Chinese history to figure out more about how you assess that company. Um, I can give other examples as we go along, but I, I think... The, yeah, we'll, the, we'll dig further yeah. into that. Thank you. Um, David, uh, you do larger investments in China as you do globally, um, and so necessarily you're probably dealing with some quite large companies. You know, how do you find out what's really going on with their uh, financial performance? Uh, well, you know, China is a more difficult place than most to find out exactly what's going on with certain kinds of companies. I mean, Chinese as a people are no more or less honest or dishonest than anybody else. So you have all the usual issues. And in fact, we invest in China in both larger companies and in a number of entrepreneurial driven smaller companies. Uh, um, and there is a class of people, many of whom are now listed on NASDAQ, who seem to regard numbers as an art, not a science. Uh, um, and we've seen repeatedly these situations where NASDAQ listed uh, companies, particularly ones run by entrepreneurs who have reversed into shells uh, for listing purposes, uh, that the numbers turn out to be, uh, sh shall we say, uh, um, and as I said, uh, an art, not a science, or at least uh, um, not consistent with uh, Western accounting practices. Uh, and it's not always easy to find out what's go going on. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that is true in China, as in many emerging markets, is that the underlying statistics that we take for granted in Western markets, things that the government puts out, or quasi-governments, or NGOs, they turn out to be totally unreliable. Uh, um, that's one thing. Secondly, there's, there's a class, as I say, of, of uh, entrepreneurs who, who regard um, a, a listing as, a quin, as the equivalent of putting down uh, chips on double zero in the roulette wheel. Um, and lots of these guys are quite, quite clever, so that uh, a standard accounting due diligence will not find out what, what's going on. So investors, not us in particular, but investors have taken uh, to uh, doing things in the Chinese economy to find out what's going on with the company that you wouldn't do uh, or wouldn't need to do in a, in a Western uh, environment, not that there's not some fanciful accounting in the West from time to time as well. Uh, but uh, I'll give you an example, uh, which will be unnamed, but from uh, uh, one of the companies we, we were looking at had a business which was a distributed business operated throughout China uh, in a financial services uh, um, sector. And the structures were so complicated, the only way we actually found out what was going on inside the company was we got the company to hire, unbeknownst to them, a couple of people who worked for us. And they went inside the company. And after they'd been inside the company, they were able to report that the accounting was entirely fraudulent. Um, but the accountants themselves would never figure it out. So that is a problem. Um, it's not unique to China, but it occurs in China more often than most other places. 
All right, thank you. We'll dig a little bit more into that later. Uh, ben, uh, you, you do distressed debt with, sounds very worrisome in any country, much less China. I mean, from, from an investor standpoint, how do you structure these things in a safe way? Yeah, I think that's a really important question and, and relates to the, the question of what can you know about a Chinese company um, because if you can know 10 things about a Chinese company in the West or in the US and only three things with certainty about a company in China, one way to handle those other seven things you don't know is by not relying on reps and warranties in a contract but rather structuring something into the deal that protects yourself. So, uh, one, of the thing, one of the three things that you can know with certainty about Chinese companies is what assets do they own. You can go and search for their title uh, in the Land and Housing Bureau. You know if they own these assets. You know if there's a senior loan on them. Those are, those are some things with certainty, even if you don't know a whole bunch of other things. And so when we, may, when we do a financing to a company in China, usually we will require them. We use what I call the pawn shop approach, which is requiring them to hand us their diamond ring, and then we give it back to them when they pay us back. So we do, uh, we, these are usually with bridge financings um, to comp all almost all uh, non-listed companies. Can you give a quick illustration of that from a, a real life example without revealing too much about it? Any yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, so let's say there's a company with, there's, let's say there's a developer with a half-built building and they've, uh, they can't get a bank loan um, because of some unique aspects with respect to lending in China. Uh, so we come in, let's say the, the, they've sunk 300 million RMB into the, into the building, and they need 100 million RMB to complete that. Well, what we would require them to do is transfer the title to the entire building to us until they pay us back, plus our rate of return, and then we give it back to them, as opposed to in the West, you would just have a bank loan, a mortgage on the house. Uh, what, the, what the lender uh, has at that point is a lawsuit if the borrower defaults. But we've been in over 300 lawsuits in China enforcing the distressed debt that we've purchased, and we know that we would rather not be in a Chinese court trying to enforce debt that we've funded at 100 cents on the dollar. So, uh, so because of that, if they default, I already own their asset. Um, and for that reason, we've never had a default on the special situations that we've done. Um, but that's a very practical approach to the fact that we don't feel comfortable relying on contract law or having to go to court for something we paid 100 cents on the dollar for. We would rather just be holding the asset. Now, the, the borrower actually is very confident that they'll be able to pay us back and stands to gain a lot from finishing the rest of that half-built building. And do so, they, didn't they trust you to give them the title back? That's a very good question, and it's something that we, we, <laughs> they trust us because they can call people that we've given title back to before. But if they're going to a purely onshore, I mean, we're a US dollar fund, um, what we found is they often have a lot of options for Chinese investors, local Chinese investors, who they will say no to, that are cheaper financing than us. But they'll say no to them because they don't trust the, the Chinese financiers to actually give them the title back if, if there's a lot of appreciation or something like that. So that's a good question and something that they do due diligence this direction on. Yeah, that's very good. John, um, segue into real estate since we're already there. <laughs> um, you know, what's your biggest obstacle do you, that you see to investing in real estate in China? I mean, it's a pretty up and down market, of course, um, but also just all the legal structures and the courts, et cetera. Uh, look, uh, for us, I think uh, one of the big advantages is we're often buying physical assets, albeit in a company structure. You can see, touch, and feel. So a lot of the assets we're going for, it's a question literally of going after the title. Um, the relationships with the banks are crucial for us. Um, and we're talking about the bankers who are funding also the existing developers and or the investor. So striking a relationship with the banker and working out how they've managed that relationship and then structuring a deal which enables us to retire that debt and make sure it's retired, i.e. using stage payments, is, is crucial to us. Um, we're lucky in that we're going into major cities where you've already got wholly owned foreign structures, so we're often taking over those structures and our diligence involves, as um, others will know around the table, uh, involved actually seeing that these uh, companies have got are clean. 
Um, one of the things I'd slightly disagree on over here is that uh, we do attach some importance to reps and warranties insofar as we're buying, for example, leases that are existing in a building, we will walk the building, check every single floor of a building. We will then take the leases that the uh, vendors provided, check those leases, and then get him to rep them specifically in the contracts. And that was learnt, not a lesson from ourselves, but we saw this happen um, in Beijing to one of our <coughs> compatriot teams or rivals, you might want to call them Reef, where they bought a building in Beijing but had not um, checked that the, the owners keep two sets of books. Basically, to do his IPO, he structured it so that these were all the rents and invented 30% of his leases, but had a real set of books. And of course, by the time the IPO came, then they discovered the faults when they went to collect the rents. And they realized they were 30 to 40% below, by which time he's absconded and gone. So for us, getting a, a tag on reps and warranties on the specific leases is actually crucial to us. Secondly, the stage payment seems to work quite well, where you're getting a bank to agree, yes, um, you've retired his debt, and we get sign-offs at various stages. The third thing we've done, which is a little bit unusual, which has helped, is um, rather than give the vendor some equity in future returns, we've got vendor financing. So we've gone to the seller and said, we want you to provide us with 10 to 15% of the financing. Keeps his interest in there. Now, it may not be enough that it won't prevent a fraud, but it certainly is one of four to five, six things that we would put in place to help us make sure that the deal is as safe as can be. Yeah, let's, uh, let's stick with due diligence for a while, just because that, you know, they say in China when you're doing business, you've got to really focus on th three things, due diligence, due diligence, due diligence. And people have different ways of doing that, because you know, even if you own 80% of a company, you may, you, your Chinese partner, if it's connected enough, can have 100% of the politics, and things can hit you pretty hard. Have, have you seen, uh, let me ask you, Howard, because you've, you've kind of gone, gone through various cycles on this. Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? What kind of companies are you, do you have more, or kind of people beyond companies, do you have more confidence in? Well, it's, it's always been a challenge. And uh, perhaps the, the news is just louder today than it has been in the past. Um, and as David alluded to, there have been uh, you know, obviously a, a lot of problems. But I, I think in general, the, the, the standard of diligence today that people apply to Chinese companies is necessarily just going to be higher than it has in the past, even in the past. Um, whether it's for an IPO, I mean, I know the, the, the big four and the other audit firms apply a much more rigorous standard, basically because they, many of them have been burned recently, than they did even in the past. And, and you know, they take certain measures uh, that are well beyond what they would take in many other places, including many forensic uh, accounting steps uh, that you would just not do in another IPO. Similarly, when you're doing an, an acquisition or an investment, I think people are doing th things like what David referred to was, you know, they're 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 doing they're they're hiring investigative agencies to do, take steps that, uh, you know, assuming that there's a very like, high likelihood of fraud, what happens? Can we find those, those situations? Um, and, and similarly for credit decisions. So I, I, I think the, I, maybe the word to put is forensic. I mean, they're, they're, they're taking foren people are taking forensic steps um, today that they just wouldn't be taking before. How do you figure out the politics of a company? And this is open to anybody, because you, know, you, can, you can look at the, uh, you can try to dig into the numbers, you can try to really do inventory and look at what they're really selling or not, but how do you dig into the politics of the people involved in the company itself? David, if you wouldn't hit that or? Uh, well, that's not necessarily an easy task, uh, um, particularly for uh, a non-Chinese. Uh, of course, all, all the folks like ourselves who do significant amounts of business, all, all of our folks in China are Chinese, pretty much, um, and people who speak the language. and preferably people who've grown up in, in the area in which they're operating, so that if you're doing a deal in Yunnan, you'd rather not have your Chinese partner be somebody from Beijing who's not going to be well-connected. We want to have somebody from Yunnan who's likely to have, have those uh, connections. Um, and to some extent, it's just sort of the luck of the draws, like government officials anywhere else or managements anywhere else. Sometimes you run into bad apples. Sometimes you run into good apples. Um, but our experience has actually been not so bad in that contest. We had one, we had one situation 
where the management attempted to hijack the company, and we had to resort to the Chinese courts, and we won a verdict in the Chinese courts. Uh, um, so, it, it, you know, you can manage these things. It, it's just uh, um, a, a little dicier than it might be in, let's say, the United Kingdom. Yeah, but you know, how about aligning yourself with local government wherever your project is? Because I've seen, I remember when uh, uh, a large American industrial company was putting a plant in uh, the outskirts of Beijing that had proprietary technology that was very important to them to protect. Um, they worked with uh, Wang Qishan when he was mayor, and they basically got the mayor and the party secretary out to their opening so that these guys had... A, you know, they had their name imprinted on this project so that, the, that if something went wrong, um, they would care about it and it might affect their reputation a little bit. Is that a strategy that works? Have you ever... Um, uh, well, that's, that's not a bad idea, but uh, official government or party change from time to time. So if you have a long-term project, and there's a lot of people who probably relied on Bo Xi Lai uh, to be their sponsor as he was doing all these things around. <laughs> Uh, and probably aren't going to ultimately like the results. That's a little more dramatic case than is normal. But people get shifted around, and you're doing something in Shanghai, and the guy who's mayor of Shanghai is sent off somewhere else, and you have somebody else who doesn't have the same in, in, in investment in, in your project. Um, and by the way, there's many levels of government. Uh, we, we did one deal where, in effect, the, the, the company was controlled and owned by a a local government, and the central government forced them to sell because they regarded the local government as corrupt. Uh, um, so it, it's complicated, and more complicated in China than in most places because government and party officials have more power than they do in most places. Does this scare investors away? Um, I don't think that scares investors away. I think people have learned to deal with the Chinese um, uh, economy for, for what it is, or the Chinese politics for what they are. Um, and it's, it's different than elsewhere, but, you know, you operate in India, you get used to Indian politics. You operate in China, you get used to Chinese politics. You operate in the United States, you get used to, you know, being done in by U.S. Congress. So. And you got the growth market. It's, it's pretty, hard to, pretty hard to stay away when, when the world has been where it is the last few years and where China is with its growth. Um, yeah, I mean, we don't, you don't per se invest in GDP growth. We invest in earnings growth because com companies... Uh, uh, don't necessarily, I mean, Chinese economy is doing moderately well, and the Chinese markets are in the tank. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but obviously China is the world's second largest economy, You're heading towards being the first economy. You have to, you have to deal with it. Let's, um, Howard, you've, you've been involved in an incredible amount of uh, well-known venture capital, private equity investments, and then also IPOs. Uh, what have you learned over the years in, in uh, taking a company from, you know, initial venture investment um, to, to IPO? Uh, you know, what, is there anything that really sticks in your mind as uh, uh, you know, rules of the road? You mean in terms of um, from the investor point of view or in the terms of the company point of view? I, I think from the, <laughs> we're talking investors here today. <laughs> right. Well, we, we've dealt with many, many different kinds of entrepreneurs in China, some very, very good and honest, some not so uh, of that. And, and, I, and, I, and the lesson learns are that, you know, you, you, you have to assume that there are all kinds of people in China, um, and you can't just believe everything that's on the prospectus, and you have to, um, you have to dig deep, as, 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 as we've been talking about. Um, I, I think part of the problem that we've seen in recent years is frankly that the people who benefit from IPOs um, are not the people are not subject to the sanctions um, of criminal law in the United States, for example, if if something goes wrong. I mean, you know, in the United States, if um, if you're an entrepreneur and you you commit um, uh, fraud, uh, then you go to jail. Uh, if you're in China and you commit fraud and your company goes, you know goes public in the U.S., then you may just end up staying in China and not go to jail. You, your downside is limited. You, you, you lose what you didn't pay for, you know. Um, but in the, so, so I think there's a disparity between um, the upside and the downside where in the United States there's more of a balance for those entrepreneurs. So I think if, if I'm an investor in, in those companies, 
I'm going to be making sure um, that the, those people are the right kind of people I want to invest with, much more than I would even in the U.S. But can you, you do structures that, you know, this is, uh, I guess, a bit of another matter, the whole VIE structure, but is that a way to bring some accountability to Chinese citizens, you know, that you're investing in that could get off scot-free if something went wrong? <clears throat> well, the, 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 VIE you know, the VIE structure, which, you know, maybe may uh, some of the audience um, may, may not be familiar with, there's a, there's a captive company structure that's been used in China for many years now to allow companies to receive foreign investment in areas in sectors where Chinese law technically doesn't permit foreign investment by, you know, for foreign purposes you say it's, it's we own it, for Chinese purposes you say we don't own it, right? <laughs> so, and these basically came about during the dot-com boom when, when the foreign venture capital invested Sina, Sohu, NetEase, the early portals, and then all of a sudden China said we don't want foreign investment in these right. structures, and so it was all designed offshore, and it's a nominee to an individual for the licensing, and it's basically a way of being able to invest in them without, without it being a complete straight trail on Chinese law. With, without, without actually owning the company. Without owning the company. Yeah. But, but I, you know, the VIE structure is a, a very good example of how temptation has given rise to lots of problems in China because, you know, human nature kind of takes over when some people see that they can take advantage of a situation and, and legally they can put you at risk. And so, those, there have been many problems with the VAE structures in China, and I, I think it's just shown itself to be more and more of a really problematic structure that, if, if at all possible, you try to avoid, but in some cases you just can't avoid it, and, and there are certain things you can do to mitigate the risk when you have it, but p many people have been burned, and it's just another area. Not, this is not the mainstream scandal area, but it, there are lots of problems with VAE structures. Let me ask, uh, I'll come back to this side of the room in a second. What about um, foreign money versus Chinese money? Because I'm told that some of the younger entrepreneurs in China actually don't want to deal with foreigners and they don't want foreign money. They'd rather keep it all local. And then there's others, of course, the other way. What do you, do you see? It's not so much they want foreigners, they don't want foreigners. That occurs sometimes. People are looking for political cover sometimes, uh, go one or the other. But the Chinese strictures are on importing capital are at least as onerous as those in exporting capital. Mm -hmm. And so if you are a Chinese entrepreneur and you want to borrow or sell a, a chunk of your capital or whatever, um, it can take you six to nine months to get permission from the government to bring the money in. So if foreigner A shows up and, and goes to uh, Jim McGregor's company and strikes a deal, Mr. McGregor may have to wait, as I said, six or nine months to actually get the money. Whereas if it's local, they don't have the same waiting requirement. They've got currency, they can buy something. Uh, and so those rules do sometimes skew the playing field in favor of local investors. Uh, um, in the bigger companies, by and large, local investors aren't sophisticated enough, don't have enough capital, so it's not such a big deal. But in the smaller entrepreneurial companies, it can make a big difference between whether somebody wants foreign money or, or will take foreign money as opposed to taking uh, uh, a renminbi denominated investment, which is why you have seen the big international firms uh, go through these machinations, particularly in Shanghai, to set up RMB funds so that we too can invest as locals. Mm. Um, and in some places, uh, notably in Shanghai, you can do that. Um, and so you see guys like ourselves operating renminbi denominated funds raised onshore in China uh, um, so that we can level the playing field a bit more. Uh, let me get back to real estate here and, and distressed assets. I mean, you, first off, let's start with real estate. I mean, if you look at the real estate business in China, it's about 15 years old, maybe a little older than that, but not, not much on people. And now everybody has to own their house or five, depending on their, their financial position. Um, you have uh, developers in China often are the guy that used to run the land bureau of the city who comes out, he's able to get the land, he does the deal, he brings in a construction company, and all of a sudden he's a developer and he's got a Bentley. And so, the, you know, often these are the people you're dealing with. How do you figure out who you can deal with, who not to deal with? Is it trial and error? Or? No, I think it's a, it's a combination, really, of, of, of what, what have you got on, on resources and network in country? It's like any market. You wouldn't come to the USA and just try and pick a partner out the blue here just because it's 
more transparent market, what you would do is you'd investigate public markets first. You would look at then what your, what your local hires are telling you. Um, in our case, we've also got a, a pretty huge research, research team um, on the ground covering something like 125 developers, some of them private, some of them public. And you'd start to assemble a picture of who you as a foreign investor bringing in capital could work with. That will then come from, not from myself, because I'm leading a team across Pan-Asia, so I'm head of the United Nations. But the, the guys on the ground, you're very heavily dependent on them. The senior resource saying, well, this group here are well known in country. You would try and put yourself in a position of being a customer. So you would actually go to the, the marketplace, you would go to their developments, and you're trying to assemble a picture of someone who would understand foreign capital and you could work with. If you can't sit around a table in your first two or three meetings, my own Chinese team would pull out and say, well, this is just not going to work with foreign capital. Um, in a bull market, you've got less time and options to do the same work. But that would be true whether you're in Japan, uh, England, or the USA. And that's when errors are made, when you're in a rush and you've got to get to various deadlines. In the current market, it's not uh, a bull market. You've got a chance now of doing extensive due diligence. You can sit with their bankers. They will open their books. You've got a, 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 you've just pointed out 15 years of development. Well, actually, the Chinese are trying to improve their, tra their transparency. They are making some strides through the securities businesses. They are making strides with the International Monetary Fund to try and improve all along. And we're asking them to leap from 15 years to what we've done in 100 years. It will take time. So do you, do you look for companies that may have a Hong Kong listing or some other yeah, book-in in a, that's in a exactly. foreign court system? You're, you're spot on. Um, for us, the best and the easiest way to go forward is we, we've tended to look at Taiwanese and Hong Kong groups. There's a little bit easier to do the due diligence. It's definitely easier to get reps and warranties, and it's easier to go up the food chain. We're a mid-cap to sort of boutique investor, so it's no coincidence that's who we've tended to buy from. The good thing is when we're buying our vehicles, people who buy from us know we've done the due diligence. It makes our exit strategy easier because they know that as an international group we'll have will have gone through quite a few due diligence steps, including interviewing all the staff, looking at the CFO, CEO. We'll have done the management checks. We would have used Kroll. Uh, we won't go as far as um, David and being able to put people into work um, into the companies, but we will have at least tread the boards of their developments and looked at their senior staff and talked to their bankers. So once you're coming to us, there's usually a pretty good exit strategy People will pay a premium knowing that the foreigner has actually cleaned up the company. Thank you. I, I understand uh, private equity, venture capital, real estate, because I've been around China a long time talking to people and being involved in business myself. I do not understand your business, and it's, it sounds very interesting. So give us an overview of what you do, because I don't know if I've known anybody in China that does what you do. OK. Um, and actually, a couple of the topics that we've discussed uh, I have a few concrete examples of investments we made that, that can touch on those topics, the VIA structure, government relations. Um, we, we manage uh, about $500 million in distressed debt and special situations. And the distressed debt side is when, a bank may, when banks in China make loans to companies, uh, eventually some of those go bad and we would buy them at uh, generally pennies on the dollar. So. Uh, two cents on the dollar, five cents on the dollar. At the point in time when a financial institution is ready to sell, uh, then the prices can be that low on non-performing loan pools, corporate non-performing loan pools of hundreds or thousands of borrowers. So back nine years ago when, we, when I first started the company with my partner, we were basically starting to file lawsuits against hundreds of corporate borrowers in China some of which were very well connected with the government, actually. Uh, China Tobacco subsidiary for, for various reasons, which I could tell the story of later. But, um, but then later on, we started doing special situations financings, which are basically bridge financings to situations where borrowers can't get a bank loan. So like the half-built building, they can't get a bank loan because, of, because government 
the government in China directs lending so much, so there are these vacuums of capital pockets where a company, for all intents and purposes, should be able to get a bank loan, but they can't, so they have to come to somebody like us and pay private equity level returns for what amounts to senior secured financing. And this relates to this kind of offshore structure uh, and VIE structure kinds of discussions, because I think, as Howard kind of alluded to, a lot of this whole, whole talk about Chinese companies being fraudulent and, and you know, trying to screw you and so forth, I think um, a lot of it is, uh, is completely unfair because if, actually I was on a panel a couple of years ago where a guy said nine out of 10 companies are Chinese companies are, are, are a fraud and I about fell out of my chair because the, the truth is nine out of 10 foreign invested companies in China Actually, they're not frauds. What, what they are is a company that the, the investors don't understand. Mm -hmm. And they haven't gone in to, to kind of look at the situation in a very onshore way. And, and for us, I mean, we, um, we don't always get comfortable. In fact, mo usually we don't get comfortable with all the due diligence we do. And so we tell the borrower what structure we're going to require, whether it's handing us assets or Things, or handing us the chop of the company, which is the company seal required to transfer assets. You get the company chop? That's amazing. Yeah, quite, quite often, actually. I mean, uh, corporate governance for us is hand us the company chop, we'll wire the money into a bank account we're a co-signer on, and we're going to, I mean, because board control isn't enough. Do you have um, bodyguards in, in China? Or <laughs> how do you, some of these guys are pretty tough you're dealing with. I mean, this is the... No offense, but this is like a very stereotypical like misperception, I think. Well, of, former journalist, you know? Okay, well, <laughs> yeah, and that's the kind of stuff you look for. But, I mean, I've only had one case where one of our, it wasn't even one of our employees was threatened. It was one of our lawyers was threatened. And, the, and that was a case, actually, a state-owned enterprise case where we bought the non-performing loan from, uh, at, it was close to zero, um, because there was nothing left in the company. And what was strange was five years ago, this company was a well-operating manufacturer with, uh, with manufacturing plants and lots of employees. And so we kind of went through the paperwork and the government records and found that all of the assets had been transferred to somebody who was related to the management of that state-owned enterprise. Well, we were really excited to find this out because Although fraud usually is a bad thing for investors, in this case it was a very good thing for us because all we had to do was go to the management and say, and actually I went to the state administration or the Bureau for the Protection of State-Owned Assets, the local head, I just went in there with our lawyer and said, look, we found that this is the case. We're really worried about that. Do you want to go to Beijing or do you want us to go to Beijing? And he said, no, 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 let's not go to Beijing. Let me call these guys. And the borrower does, the management of the borrower doesn't want to go to prison. The local government doesn't want us to disclose to the Beijing Bureau for the Protection of State-Owned Assets that this has occurred. So when you pay one cent on the dollar for this non-performing loan and you have that amount of leverage, you get paid a very good return to go away. And so there, and then there are other cases where you, I mean, we've sort of relied on this Beijing government versus the local government many times. And in fact, Beijing wants the courts to be more predictable and to not be so uh, influenced by the local government. And they have a, they have, and in the case I mentioned about China Tobacco, we, a very similar case where one of our borrowers, all the assets had been transferred to a subsidiary of China Tobacco, uh, which a lot of people smoke in China. So that company has a lot of cash, right? And, but they did not pay for those assets. And probably between the Chinese parties, this wasn't anything fraudulent. They were just saying, okay, well, you know, here, here's the assets. They did some kind of a deal, that, but there was no consideration paid for those assets. So we sued under an alter ego liability or fraudulent conveyance uh, claim. We sued the subsidiary of China Tobacco. Now, the problem was that subsidiary was one of the biggest taxpayers in Hunan province where we sued them. But fortunately, Beijing's ha Beijing has a rule that says if there's reason to believe there will be that much local protectionism, you can transfer it to Beijing. So we transferred the case to Beijing and then one froze their land, froze their bank accounts, and, and then settled. Hold that thought. Courts. <laughs>
Courts. Yeah. Well, local government versus um, central government using that leverage or not, and what courts can you trust or, or not? What are, what are getting better? What incentives do the yeah. courts have? I'll start with you and then to David. Yeah, so th this is a very interesting question. I mean, the, 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 the typical image of China is that all the courts are corrupt and that you can never get a good uh, um, judgment, a fair judgment out of a court in China, and that's actually very not true um, to a certain degree, to a certain point. Um, and, 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 and the reason I qualify that is because in, in reality, most judges in China now are trying to do a good job. There are a lot of corrupt judges, and China has lots of press out there that says there are a lot of corrupt judges. And, and for the first time, the Supreme Court, the head of the Supreme Court is a lawyer, <laughs> right? <laughs> and he's a pretty, he's a pretty there, there powerful are, guy. There are a lot of judges that are not lawyers, you're right, and many of them were retired military that got given that were given jobs as judges, um, but but o over time, what's happened is there there has been a professional judiciary that's developed, and they're trying to do a good job. There are two main problems. Number one, there are still a, a fair number of corrupt judges who can get bought off, and the Chinese government freely admits that. And there's lots of statistics that they published about how much bribery there is uh, in the court system. Second problem is that in important cases, the government will tell the court what to do, because the court system is not independent. It's, a, it's an arm of the government. It's, it's, it's actually a subdivision of a particular <laughs> arm of the government. Well, and what about the Zhongfa Wei, the, the party structure that's next right. to the courts, too? So it's, it's completely not independent. So if there is an issue that's of, of high political or policy importance, then the court is not free to decide based on the law. They're, they're directed to do what they should do by the government, and it may not, and they'll have to find a reason to rationalize it under the under the legal system. So that's the the risk that parties to a um, a court case have in China is that either th there may be corruption, which that can be combated if to a certain extent because you can put the case under the microscope so that the the judges will feel that, that you know I, I can't take the risk of, of doing something bad here. So that 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 there's potential. Um, solutions to, but the, the harder nut is that when the government has a, a dog in the fight, um, unless you can have a, a stronger connection in the government that's going to neutralize the other side, then the government may tell the court what to do. So what you mean is you never go into court without doing all your preparation outside of court first? Absolutely. You got to have the political alignment and the various interest groups aligned. Well, you know, it's, uh, if it's not one, I mean, you know, in the, the cases that that um, Ben is talking about, those those probably don't rise to the level of a policy decision by the the, the government in many cases, and and you just go through the normal process, and you know, and, and you yeah. Can, you know, <clears throat> but at the time you make the investment, you know, you you can do you can know to some extent is the government going to have a dog in the fight? So. You know, I would rather buy an unsecured loan to a company that owns an office building than a secured, a, a, a secured, a loan that's secured by a manufacturing plant that's worth a billion RMB, 10 times my money, you know, because the manufacturing plant employs thousands of people. And at the end of the day, you're not going to get a court to auction the manufacturing plant, have all these thousands of people out on the street. But the office building, even if I'm unsecured, I can attach it. Nobody, the local government doesn't care who owns an office building. You know, it doesn't rise to the level of something that the government cares about. And I think it's the best, the most important thing is when you make the investment, ask yourself, does the government have a dog in this fight? And then, you know, price accordingly, basically. David, your, your firm is, you know, large and prominent and often it's, it, it's the courts, I mean, in my experience, treat people like you a lot better because of, of your, of your stature, it's a big deal if a court ruling unfairly goes against a company like yours. Is that well, we haven't had a lot of experience. We've had two situations, uh, um, uh, both in fairly substantial size uh, investments or potential investments. Um, in one case, which happened to be in Shanghai, um, the politics were that the uh, mayor of Shanghai and the party secretary went to the court and said, not that we expect this result or that result, but this is a commercial dispute and it's important that you deal with it fairly. Um, and we wound up having a litigated 
case, which would be no different than litigation in any Western country. It was there were lawyers on both sides and all that, and the, the judgment went the right way in our view. Um, but there was politics, but the politics was not decided this way. The politics was, we want this to be a clean case. Uh, the second one was a fight between the Beijing government and the local government uh, over an asset nominally owned by the local government. And it never went anywhere near court. It was all politics. Uh, uh, what do you do as a foreign company when, you're, when what you have money in is stuck in internal politics like that? That's a, not a comfortable place well, to be. Well, we have a, a case now in which we and several others uh, 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 we can show you how you, the, you can get the politics to work not so well. Uh, we have a, 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 a situation where we and a number of other foreign entities uh, own what is nominally a, control, a controlling stake in an institution. The CEO of the institution is a princeling and is incompetent, and we can't fire him uh, um, because the local politics are such that we can't get through the political situation. Uh, and sooner or later it will get solved, but it's going to have to get elevated up, and a political decision will have to be made perhaps as high as the state council. Um, and so this is a little different than you might find in, if you're dealing in the, in the Bronx. Can you fix that just by making the person a chairman? And get, Not if the person doesn't want to be the chairman. Oh, yeah. Not somebody wants to go play golf and just make money. Exactly. That makes it more, much more difficult. Let me, let me, you know, we were talking earlier before we came on stage about the thing about China is it, it, uh, the outside world looks at China as worse than it is or better than it is, and never, you know, go, the opinions go up and down. Does this affect your, your investors in your funds on whether they want you in China or how, you know, the way they, they respond when you talk about Chinese investments? Well, our investors are in it for the long term. And so while, while you've raised the money, you have 10-year capital, uh, you have discretion. Um, it does have some impact, obviously, when you go out to raise a new fund. If it's a time when China's hot, and you have a big China operation, people are interested in giving you capital. And if it's a time when the Chinese market is not hot, people are not so interested in giving you capital. Um, um, but it's more on a uh, you know, long wave cycle than it is uh, in, on a short term uh, consideration. But you have the same thing with China. I'd, I'd make a couple of points. Uh, the same thing with China as you have uh, everywhere else, which is, um, Life is cyclical. People loved China when the PEs were 40 and 50 on the Shanghai Stock Exchange. Everybody wanted to rush in and put their money in China. Now the PEs are down by 75% and nobody wants to invest in China. And there's something wrong with that picture. It ought to be the other way around, but such is, is, is human nature. Um, I want to make another point, which we covered in, in, in passing, which is the due diligence notions that Ben and John have been talking about. It is definitely the case that due diligence is tougher in, in China, and you have to be more careful, and accountants have learned that. In, in, in a due diligence exercise in California, if you, you might go to the CFO if you were an accountant, at least in our experience, and say, I'd like to see your bank statements, and you'd get them from the CFO, and all would be well. You would never do that in China. You have to go to the bank and say, let me see the bank statements for this company, because you can't be sure that the there's not two sets of books or three sets of books. Uh, um, and because China is uh, uh, such a powerful economic force and people have been so interested, people have done things in to invest in China, which they would never do in any other market. And part of that has to do with responding to Chinese strictures, but in the, like the VIE structure, which in a simple sense is the, the company that's listed here actually doesn't own anything. It has a contract with somebody who claims to own something in the PRC. And PS, as you said, it's typically something that, that the foreigner isn't legally entitled to own under Chinese law, which is why you have this. You would never invest in Brazil or Nigeria or Russia in that kind of structure, because you, you don't own anything. In fact, you wouldn't invest in that kind of structure in the United States. If I came to the market here and I said, well, here's the deal. Um, I have a contract with Howard, and Howard actually owns the business. But I have a contractual right, so I'm taking my company public. You say you're completely out of your mind. But that's what the VIE structure is, in effect. And people have done it because it's China and it's so sexy and it's such a wonderful place to do business. 
So uh, there's been, in my view, a little bit too Pollyanna-ish of you. Uh, it's not the Chinese fault. Uh, um, so you just have to be moderately prudent as anywhere else. And people have been often imprudent in China because of the force and magnetism of the economy. Yeah, yeah. where do you, where do you, where is the line between being, being flexible but to get around Chinese rules that don't make sense and heading off in a dumb direction? Yeah, I, I, yeah, just to pick on, up on a theme, that, you know, it takes two hands to clap. The, the fact that there's so many Chinese um, frauds coming out of the, the woodwork is not just because the Chinese are bad, it's because there are a lot, there's a lot of froth in the Chinese market and part of it is there are too many investors that are willing to be duped um, and too many people that are willing to, to take sh shortcuts. Um, and I think people have learned the lesson the hard way on that. Um, there's a lot of money trying to get into China, has been a lot of money trying to get into China. And on top of that, you have domestic investors now with flush with cash. Capital is not in short supply in China. It's the last thing that China lacks. Um, and, and so in that environment, yeah, it, you know, it's, it's obviously true that you have to be more careful with your money. Um, now, the, the market is down today, um, so you're in a more rational environment. But, you know, a few years ago, it was very, very, very frothy. Um, but, you know, now we're sitting with um, the IPOs coming out of China have dried up. We have this, uh, you know, we had all these backdoor listings that, um, frankly, there's a number of U.S. hedge funds that... Should, you know, are responsible for this as much as Chinese investors. There was these guys that were putting these deals together and then pumping and dumping the stock. And that has then given all Chinese listed companies a bad name for a period of time. And now, really, IPOs have, have dried up. We have this um, battle on the accounting board, which is very serious, um, where basically the US PCOB, the accounting board, needs to uh, look at uh, any foreign auditor that is auditing a company that's listed on a US exchange. They just have to examine them every three years. Where all these Chinese companies are listed in the US, I think there's about 200 before you get to the pink sheets and, and others. Um, they have to certify the auditors and the Chinese have said, no, this is a sovereignty issue. We can't let that happen. So in fact, you've got, now got the the um, you know, P P PWCs and E and Ys of this world, their Chinese operations could actually be deregistered with the SEC, and this is at a at a stalemate now. And then they're also stuck between state-owned enterprise, which is some of these SOEs are saying you cannot give our audit to U.S. regulators because we have state secrets. Um, so this is really a, a kind of a mess right now. And how does it affect what you guys do? Well, you know, and it's not just a public company issue, it's also a multinational company issue because many multinationals, as we all know, have huge operations in China and they rely on the China arm of PwC or Deloitte or whoever to do the audits of their subsidiaries in China. I mean, half of, of young brands you know, in China is, um, in, the, in, in the world is, is China revenue. So um, if, if they can't get a, a clean audit from, from China, then it affects <laughs> Their, 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 their global situation, obviously. So I, I think this is a situation that's going to get, it's going to have to get resolved and resolved on a global basis. Well, there's, there's, there's another issue on, on, the, on the accountants, which people are just beginning to focus on, because you have the, the major accounting firms who are all doing business in China. So you go to Deloitte or whoever it is, and you say, I, I want you to audit this company in China. But it turns out Deloitte's position is that Actually, this is a, a related but not controlled entity. Uh, it, we let them use the name, but it's actually you know, S Jones and Smith, or the Chinese equivalent thereof. And they're an affiliate, but we're not responsible for what they do. People think that if you're hiring a name accounting firm, you're going to get the same performance and the same standards and the same accountability. But you don't, because when something goes wrong, the guys in New York who run Deloitte say, wait a minute here, this has nothing to do with us. This is our Chinese affiliate. It's not a subsidiary, it's an affiliate, and we don't control it, and therefore we have no responsibility. Yeah. Accounting? Accounting, I mean, two, okay, so two, two points here. One is we do our own due diligence mostly. I mean, everybody in the company other than me is, is Chinese. Everybody speaks fluent Chinese, is based in China. So, there's no way we would ever hire a big four accounting firm to 
find out answers for us in China. Um, <clears throat> we might hire a local accounting firm that we trusted who knows all of the guys and you know, knows where to get the information and so forth. Um, another point, though, is uh, the VI, not to talk about the VA structure again, but just the way we've responded to these types of things is that recently, one example is recently um, a company that, that was listed um, outside of China and needed to pay back their bondholders came to us and said, hey, can we issue a new bond to you which will be listed offshore, traded offshore? Um, and our response was no, because it's not to the company that owns anything. It's to a company that has a contract with the, company, with the operating company. But our counter to that was, look, we'll do a financing onshore uh, with, your, uh, with your onshore operating entity that, uh, where you transfer the equity in that entity um, into an escrow, you transfer some of your assets to us, and so we get as close as we can to where the operations occur. And it's understandable that people in historically haven't always done that because at the time, 2005, 2006, when uh, everybody wanted to put money into China, it, the regulations made it very difficult to do that um, quickly. And so these structures occurred. But, uh, and also people did not go about the due diligence that, um, that where there are answers that you could find, but that, you know, they weren't finding them. So I think we have just kind of a very practical approach to whether it's the structure or finding information on shore, but definitely not relying on Deloitte and Touche to like, tell me, does a company own an asset in China? Not that they can't do that. I just think it's something that we can do ourselves, and, um, and then we're certain about the answer. Um, it's a combination. I, I, again, slight disagreement. I think you do have the uh, foreign accounts, but you've got to go to the big four for us. But equally, we would use a local accounts firm. Long and short of it is you've got to construct your own balance sheet anyway. Everything we're doing is we're following the cash, and we're following try. the cash flows in our business. So you would do, yes, on the one side, you do the accounting. Then you do some forensic accounting through the local accounts. I'm afraid also you've got to go and construct your own balance sheet. You've got to look at the sales, the revenues, the liabilities. You'll be doing that with your own team to get comfortable with what's about to happen. The long and the short of that is that you're going to be spending more on due diligence costs than in any other environment that I can think of that we work in. So that could rattle up really quickly. So your review process and stop-go decisions have to be very interactive because you can get through a million, two, three million US dollars worth of due diligence. Yeah, it's really expensive hand. to hire human capital that speaks English in China. But in my view, there's an inverse correlation between a person's ability to speak English and their value to me in China. So the more time somebody spent outside of China uh, working at Deloitte and Touche in New York, the less valuable they are to us in terms of you know, finding information in China. So you're going to pay more. For those people who have both skills where they can kind of, they have the foreign experience and they have a lot of local experience and, and that's very expensive. Yeah, when I was, yeah, run, when just, I was running a research a company, I used to hire Chinese reporters and very local. They would go down to, a, if we were checking out a, you know, what a factory was doing, they'd go down and they'd hang around in the noodle shops on the edge of the factory and talk to people. I had this one young lady from Sichuan. She was a chain smoker, had ulcers, um, and could dig up any, inf some of the information she dug up was so good we couldn't use it because it involved military, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, there's definitely people that can dig it up. I think we should go to audience questions. Um, do we have some microphones out there for this? Um, if not, I'll have you yell. I, I just flew in last night, so I'm not all that familiar with the protocol here this year. Yes, please. I think there's a microphone coming your way. Identify who you are and go. Hi, um, Michael D. I live in Singapore. Um, what you've described is a short seller heaven. Why isn't there a bigger short market, and why aren't you profiting on all of these downsides rather than trying to protect your upside? I know there's been some firms like Muddy Waters and others with Sino Forest, but it seems to me that, that all these problems uh, just make for fish in a barrel shooting if you want to get short. Yeah, can I answer that? Yep. 
You're, you're dead wrong. <laughs> um, the, but other than that, <laughs> <laughs> it was a nice question. So, no, I, lo I love it when people think that China is an impossible place to invest. And I, love, and I love the fact that there are huge barriers to entry to finding information in China or to structuring things in a way that you can get US dollars into China. Why? Because it creates vacuums of capital. That is a massive inefficiency. There's you know, tremendous, everybody said, Howard said this, I'm gonna disagree with him too. He, he said that there's no shortage of cash in China. You know, that's one thing there's no shortage of, but that's true, but in certain places, in other places, you know, whether it's because of the VIE sort of regulations or because uh, China decided to turn off all lending to real estate developers, there are these pockets of no, where there's mispriced risk. And I think that's one of the things that creates that. And so there's a tremendous amount of underpriced uh, foreign listed reverse merger companies. Look, I've, I've never met Jim Chanos. I think because he's never been to China. I, mean, I guess he was there once. But you know, you, uh, what's legal in the US is kind of frightening. And he goes on CNBC about every nine months and trashes China, and, and then he makes his money off his shorts, and then he goes away for a while and comes back and does it again. And uh, I guess that's a legitimate way to make money in the United States. But in the end, you're just taking a lot of decent companies, and, and you got a lot of investors in the States that that is their view of China is you know, him going on and trashing the bubble in the real estate market uh, without talking about the nuance that this stuff isn't leveraged and on and on. So I think there's, you get a lot of misimpressions here. I go to New York and I meet with mutual funds and hedge funds a lot now and talk about China. And um, some of these funds that have been investing in China for a long time, it's funny how they'll, they'll just pick up a, the rhythm of CNBC uh, or whatever, and then just go with it without really looking behind what's going on. And, you know, you got you got people that are on the ground here. Um, it's much more it's much more complicated as everything is. Well, and, and we've been through many of these cycles too. So, I, I, you know, if you start from 1980 and you go to now, it, it, at least there have been four cycles where there have been China has been in the doghouse, and each time, you know, people say it's the end. And of course, there have been many series of books and predictions about. It's the end, it's the collapse of China or whatever. Just a comment about this idea and private equity. Private equity is a long only business. We're not in the business of shorting, even if it is fraudulent, because that's not what we're about. We're about investing for the long term and fixing companies. You obviously don't want to get defrauded along the way, but we don't have a mechanism and our, people don't invest with us for short sales, even if it was a good idea, which as Ben points out, is generally not. Uh, let's go for another question. Um, the gentleman here. I'm sorry if you had somebody identified already. I can't see that well. Uh, good morning. John McClellan with the Los Angeles County Pension Fund. Question. Um, I'm under the impression that the, a lot of the local governments use uh, purchase of land from farmers for very low prices. Um, and then reselling to developers at huge markups as a, you know, basically a source of great revenue. Is that, is that phenomena really going on? And, and how sustainable is it? Because I'm, you know, I, I hear that uh, it's, a, it's a source of great uh, uh, unrest. I'll, pro, act, I'll actually unrest. take this question. I mean, changing rural land to urban land is complicated. But a, a city government can do it, um, but under, under the law, until recently, they've been changing this law, they only had to pay the farmer, only they, were, they, they could only pay the farmer the agriculture value of that land, which is a, a pittance compared to what it's gonna become. And then it becomes urban land, and then the developers in the city, and this is how municipalities in China have been funding themselves. And that's one of the problems with the real, real estate bubble. It's also led to huge pollution problems, and I'll get into that in a second. So that, game is out, local governments have real debt problems, and so what's gonna to have to happen in the real, they're gonna to have to get a real estate tax because people will own three, four, five, ten flats because where are you gonna put your money in China? There's no penalty for holding um, those flats empty because there's no annual real estate tax. It's not gonna be easy, but eventually they're gonna to have to implement that in order to fund local governments. This leads to pollution. China's development model, because Beijing has six ring roads, we now have ring roads to hell in China. 
because if you built a ring road, then you can declare that land inside the ring road to be urban land a lot easier than rural land. So as Beijing built these ring roads and went through this, the rest of China looked at that model. And so we've got all these, you know, kind of like Los Angeles is growing up with cars and ring road after ring road. And part of it had to do with local governments being able to change that structure. So you got 50 million farmers or so in China that were paid a pittance for their land as this went on. And that's also a big source of unrest. Happily, we're not in the real estate business. Yeah. <laughs> On another question? Uh, yes, I'm Jean Hoysrat from Moose Partners. And uh, Ben, I think it's a question for you. Uh, I hear that uh, if you have an issue with uh, office buildings or some sort of property, because they're, it's not a big employer, you don't have an issue with the government or certain levels of government getting in and being able to enforce your rights. Do you have any examples of other sectors where you feel that there's a hands-off approach? Um, the, thank you, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, for us, it's, we're very asset-driven because we, we believe in, you know, there's areas of law in China, property law, contract law, you know, creditor rights enforcement, and so forth. The, the thing that's most predictable from our view is property law. And so to the extent that an industry has an asset that we feel like we can liquidate, then that would be an inter industry we'd be interested in. And the, basically the question is not what industry is it, but what are my holding that gives me leverage to, to, that makes the borrower have every reason to pay me back. Um, an example of another deal that we're, that we're looking at, um, I can't say the name of the company because it actually is listed as a, pri it's a privatization of a company not real, real estate related at all, and, but it's a privately owned company. These, the, the people they employ are not, uh, it's not thousands of, the peop of people that the government kind of told the SOE, you know, you need to employ these people. Um, but the collateral we're using in that case is the, the founder owns another public company. So we're requiring them to put a couple times our money of, of uh, the stock in that public company in escrow if they don't pay us back, then we get that stock. That is something we can liquidate because it's being traded. The, the founder believes that he'll be able to pay us back and it won't be a problem, so he's willing to do that. So the question is more kind of asset-oriented and, and collateral-oriented than it is what industry is it. But on the non-performing loan side, where we're actually, we have you know, thousands of what their SOEs, every industry, private companies as well, you know, then we're pricing based on what we think uh, we can do with it and and yeah i mean the more i wouldn't say we, we, we do price value to state-owned enterprises because we can do things with them but it's going to be closer to you know closer to to zero another question here in the third row hi my name is john mccoach i work for the toronto stock exchange and tsx venture exchange in canada and we list about 55 companies that are owned and operated and or managed and operated in China, and we're looking to list more. We have an office in Beijing. My question um, is, any advice from the panel on how we um, rebuild investor confidence in these companies? We've just recently introduced a number of standards and, and guidance to help bring disclosure and governance standards up to what you'd expect in Canada or the United States, and wondering if there's other things you'd recommend. Uh, Howard, do you want to tackle that? Well, certainly reverse mergers have gotten a bad name. So um, I, I would not start with reverse mergers when looking at um, listing candidates. Um, you know, most of the firms that um, have been doing that business are out of business or have stopped doing it. And um, uh, so that would be one. David, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, it seems to me that the problem in, in, at least with NASDAQ, I don't know what you guys have done in Toronto, has, has been that the regulations have let people do reverse mergers with less disclosure and less data than if they did a front door listing. Um, and that is a bad idea. Um, they should be required to have the same level of disclosures and the same, same level of accounting treatment as, uh, as, as if they did a, a regular way uh, listing. Maybe you guys are doing that. I don't know. I think another, another idea is 
bring the CEOs of the company over under the auspices of the exchange and have some events where they're seeing these people face to face and they can kind of gain some confidence in them as people. And, and uh, require that the CEO hires uh, a, an investor relations consultant to tell them what they need to say, what's, you know, because they, a lot of these people, they, it's not that they're trying to defraud anybody. They just, they just don't really know what, what the reporting is supposed to be and what's the purpose of it and so forth. Yeah, some of what we look at as fraud in the states here is really just local practices going global. Because China's never really, you know, the regulatory and legal system is, is being defined and laws that don't make sense don't get taken off the books. So it's quite a culture of getting around things as much as it is following rules. Uh, next question. Uh, okay. Hi, Dan Veru, the Chief Investment Officer at Palisade Capital Management. We, we focus a lot on domestic small cap companies, but many of those companies have operations in China where they've partnered locally and that's been an effective way for them to get into those markets. And the commentary I hear over and over again, uh, you know, two companies in a very similar industry, one can be doing very well, one, one could not be doing as well. What metrics, financial metrics, are, do you think are most relevant when understanding where China is in the economic cycle. I mean, you mentioned the CNBC effect of Chanos coming on. You know, one day China PMAs are, PMIs are strong, next month they might be, you know, there's been so much unevenness. What are some key metrics that investors maybe should be zeroing in on to really give the best representation of economically where the, com where the country is? Well, let me, let me hit that politically first, then I'll let my colleagues hit the economic part. I mean, right now, China's at a, at a turning point of where the model has to change in order to keep growth going. And you know, got to be careful of, of the national statistics. Li Keqiang, the current premier, years ago, five years ago, said, these are made by men, you can't depend on them, something like that. So you have to be careful. Then there's other people saying, well, let's look at electricity. Uh, but that's also very problematic because it's state companies. And, and when coal is up, they sometimes just shut down because they can only charge a fixed price for electricity. So it's very, it's very complicated. I think politically what you've got to look for now is some real reform coming out. And that's going to have to be interest rate reform instead of that fixed three-point spread. That's going to have to get flexible. And um, taking some power away from the state banks and reforms on the housing registration on taking these migrant workers step by step and making them uh, legal urban residents and therefore consumers. And, Watch in the fall because it will be the third meeting of the party, the third plenum under, since the new leadership, and that's when the actual reforms are expected to come out. It was the third plenum um, when Deng Xiaoping in 79 or 78 came out with the reforms. So I'd watch October and November, the party meeting, and, and just try to parse those reforms that come out and make sure, and they got to, it all starts with financial. Any other thoughts? Uh, well, on a company basis, um, it's what Ben is talking about. You've got to follow the cash. Nothing else actually matters in a Chinese company. You've got to follow the cash. And looking at EBITDA, looking at um, EPS, looking at all those things, they can all be manipulated and often are, sometimes for fraudulent reasons. And others, as, as Jim says, just because there's some cockamamie Chinese regulations that people are trying to get around. But the, the cash doesn't lie if you can trace it. Yeah, last question here, because I think we're done in about one minute. Yes, sir. Hello. Mark Christopher from the Arkin Group. Uh, we're one of these corporate intelligence and investigative firms that collects information on companies in China. Um, I'm interested in panel's thoughts on access to information, uh, collection of information on individuals and companies in China for business purposes still exists in a bit of a legal gray area, and uh, the spigot gets opened and closed, sometimes in response to uh, what's going on politically, sometimes in response to uh, when Chinese companies are getting bashed in the press on CNBC. Um, I'm interested to hear a little bit more about uh, that dynamic and where you see it going. Do you mean like, like uh, official filings being available and... Official filings being available and then not being available uh, and 
you know, Jim, you had asked about bodyguards and sort of some of the practical considerations for uh, really trying to, trying to get good information. I, I, I may be wrong here, but I know after David Barboza at the New York Times did the stories on Wen Jiabao's family, you know, apparently having 2.8 billion in assets. I know David well. He just got a Pulitzer and he deserved it. Uh, that was old-fashioned gumshoe reporting, going to this office, to this office, to this office, then figuring out how to connect names. And so I'm, I'm told those records are getting less and less available now. And Bloomberg did the same thing. What are you seeing, Howard? Yeah, it's true. Um, a lot of his um, research was through the SAIC, which is the State Administration of Industry and Commerce, which keeps filings and records. And accessibility to those records now has been reduced. And in Hong Kong, right? Even Hong Kong's tightening up accessibility, I read. Yeah. They're, um, yeah. they're making it very difficult to go behind the veil of all the uh, holding companies in the British Virgin Islands. So a lot of people will be able to hold various corporates and various interests, but you're not going to be able to pierce that veil in the future. So I think our time is up, right? It's, uh, it's 10.45. Thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank our panelists for taking the time here.